He won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Britain's health officials have advised that people with a history of serious allergies not get the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. The warning came after two people reported severe reactions on the first day of vaccination. National Health Service Medical Director Stephen Powis said two NHS workers with a history of allergies were affected. As is common with new vaccines, the MHRA have advised on a precautionary basis that people with a significant history of allergic reactions do not receive this vaccination, he said. Powis noted, that both are recovering well and the Medical and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency is looking to see if the reactions are linked to the vaccine. An allergy is a medical condition that causes someone to become sick after eating, touching, or breathing something that is harmless to most people. For now, MHRA said... Any person with a history of a significant allergic reaction to a vaccine, medicine, or food should not receive the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The health agency said it would seek further information. Pfizer and BioNTech said they are working with investigators to better understand each case and its causes. Last week, Britain became the first nation in the world to approve the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for emergency use. It started its vaccination program yesterday. Today, the Canadian Health Agency approved the vaccine for emergency use. And the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and European Medicines Agency are looking at the data and are expected to approve the vaccine for emergency use shortly. Documents published by Pfizer and BioNTech showed that people with a history of severe allergic reactions were excluded from the trials. The drug makers also advised doctors to look out for such reactions in trial participants who were not previously known to have severe allergies. In the United States, the FDA released documents on Tuesday in preparation for an advisory committee meeting on Thursday. The documents say the Pfizer vaccine's efficacy and safety data met expectations for emergency approval, and only 0.63% of people in the vaccine group reported possible allergic reactions in trials. Peter Openshaw is a professor of experimental medicine at Imperial College, London. He said that was a very small number. The fact that we know so soon about these two allergic reactions and that the regulator has acted on this to issue precautionary advice shows that this monitoring system is working well, he added. For several months, Western drug makers like Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca have released and published information on the vaccine trials. But China and Russia have not released any information on their COVID-19 vaccine candidates. 
On Tuesday, the Health Ministry of the United Arab Emirates said in a statement that it found a vaccine developed by China National Pharmaceutical Group, or Sinopharm, to have an 86% rate of effectiveness against COVID-19. UAE said it started Phase 3 trials of the Sinopharm vaccine in July. And the country, home to the well-known cities of Dubai and Abu Dhabi, approved emergency use of the vaccine for some groups. The health ministry said its study of the vaccine shows no serious safety concerns. It also said that 31,000 volunteers across 125 nationalities participated in the UAE trial. The volunteers were between 18 and 60 years old and received two shots of the vaccine over 28 days. The ministry did not report how many volunteers were given the vaccine or a placebo, a shot with an inactive substance. It also did not say if any side effects were identified or how many volunteers became ill. It was unclear if the announced results included only those taking part in the UAE trials or if they also included results from China and other countries. Both UAE health officials and Sinopharm did not answer requests for comments from international news agencies. The Sinopharm vaccine uses an inactivated virus to help the body produce antibodies to fight the coronavirus. It is similar to how polio vaccines are made. The drug maker is still conducting trials in China and countries like Egypt and Peru. However, the Chinese government has approved the vaccine for emergency use. And almost one million government officials, healthcare workers, and others in China have been injected with the shots. After the UAE vaccine announcement, city officials in Abu Dhabi said it would restart all economic, tourism, cultural, and entertainment activities in the Emirate within two weeks. Chinese spacecraft has successfully dropped asteroid samples from space. The samples landed safely in the Australian outback. The container carrying the asteroid soil samples was dropped from 220,000 kilometers in space by Japan's Hayabusa 2 spacecraft. Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency, known as JAXA, confirmed the container, or capsule, had landed in Australia on Sunday. The unpiloted Hayabusa 2 was launched in December 2014. It arrived near the asteroid Ryugu in June 2018. Its mission was to gather soil samples that may provide information about how our solar system formed. The spacecraft touched down twice on Ryugu, which sits more than 300 million kilometers from Earth. The first touchdown took place in February 2019 when Hayabusa 2 collected surface dust samples. Then, in July 2019, the spacecraft collected samples from below the surface of Ryugu. It did so by landing in a hole that it blasted open. The operation was the first of its kind in the history of space exploration. In addition to the samples, Hayabusa 2 collected data about the asteroid, which experts say could be 4.6 billion years old. The spacecraft left the area in late 2019. 
its Ryugu mission has now officially ended. Officials say they look forward to examining the samples in a laboratory. The project's manager, JAXA's Yuichi Tsuda, called the capsule a treasure box. He said the 40 centimeter container had arrived in perfect shape. I really look forward to opening it and looking inside. Officials have said the capsule is believed to mainly contain soil, but it may also contain some gases likely attached to the samples. After a quick inspection at a lab in Australia, the capsule was sent to JAXA's research center in Sagamihara, near Tokyo. Asteroids orbit the Sun but are much smaller than planets. They are among the oldest objects in the solar system and may help scientists better understand how Earth evolved. Collecting such samples can give researchers a rare chance to study these mysterious rocky objects. JAXA officials say the study of asteroids may also help with future resource development and lead to new ways to protect Earth from collisions with big meteorites. The only other nation to successfully collect an asteroid sample is the United States. The U.S. Space Agency NASA announced last month that its OSIRIS-REx spacecraft had completed the sample operation on the asteroid Bennu. NASA said it was pleased the spacecraft collected more sample material than expected. Hayabusa 2 followed Japan's first Hayabusa mission, which launched in 2003. After a series of technical difficulties, the first Hayabusa spacecraft sent back samples from another asteroid, Itokawa, in 2010. But Hayabusa burned up in a failed re-entry attempt. The capsule, however, made it to Earth. Many Japanese were impressed by the first Hayabusa mission, which they considered a big success given all the troubles it had experienced. JAXA later also had problems with missions involving spacecraft sent to explore Venus and Mars. JAXA's Tsuda says the Hayabusa 2 team used all the hard lessons learned from the earlier missions to complete the Ryugu operation with perfect results. Some Japanese watching the event in public cried as the capsule successfully entered the atmosphere, briefly appearing as a fireball in the sky. About an hour after separating from the capsule, Hayabusa 2 was sent on another mission to a smaller asteroid called 1998-KY26. It is expected to take the spacecraft 11 years to reach that asteroid. Hayabusa 2's new mission aims to study possible ways to prevent large meteorites from hitting Earth. I'm Brian Lynn. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites 
the World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Soon after the Civil War ended in 1865, thousands of Americans began to move west to settle the land. The great movement of settlers continued for almost 40 years. The great empty west, in time, became fully settled. The discovery of gold had already started a great movement to California. Robert Bostick and Leo Scully tell about the gold rush and the important part cowboys played in settling the West. Men had rushed to the gold fields with hopes of becoming rich. A few found gold. The others found only hard work and high prices. When their money was gone, they gave up the search for gold. But they stayed in California to become farmers or businessmen or laborers. Some never gave up the search for riches. They moved back toward the east, searching for gold and silver in the wild country between California and the Mississippi River. Each new gold rush brought more people from the east. Mining camps quickly grew into towns with stores, hotels, even newspapers. Most of these towns, however, lived only as long as gold was easy to find. Then they began to die. In some of the gold centers, big mining companies bought up all the land from those who first claimed it. These companies brought in mining machines that could dig out the gold from deep underground and separate it from the rock that held it. These companies needed equipment and other supplies. Transportation companies were formed. They carried supplies to the mining camps in huge wagon trains pulled by slow-moving oxen. Roads were built, and in some places, railroads. The great wealth taken from the gold and silver mines was usually invested in other businesses. Shipping railroads, factories, stores, land companies. More jobs were created in the West, and living conditions got better. More and more people decided to leave the crowded East for a new life in the West. But the big Eastern cities continued to grow. New factories and industrial centers were built. People moved from the farms to find work in the cities. The growth of these industrial centers created a big demand for food, especially meat. Chicago quickly became the heart of the meat industry. Railroads brought animals to Chicago where packing companies killed them and prepared the meat for eastern markets. Special railroad cars kept the meat cold so it would remain fresh until sold. As the meat industry grew, the demand for fresh meat increased. More and more cattle were needed. There were millions of cattle in Texas but no way to get them to the eastern markets. 
The closest point on the railroad was Sedalia, Missouri, more than 1,000 kilometers away. Some cattlemen believed it might be possible to walk cattle to the railroad, letting them feed on the open grassland along the way. Early in 1866, a group of Texas cattlemen decided to try this. They put together a huge herd of more than 260,000 cattle and set out for Sedalia. There were many problems on that first cattle drive. The country was rough, grass and water, sometimes hard to find. Bandits and Indians followed the herd, trying to steal cattle. Farmers had put up fences in some areas, blocking the way. Most of the great herd was lost along the way, but the cattlemen believed they had proved that cattle could be walked long distances to the railroad. They believed a better way to the railroad could be found, with plenty of grass and water. The cattlemen got the Kansas Pacific Railroad to extend its line west to Abilene, Kansas. There was a good trail from Texas to Abilene. Cattlemen began moving their herds up this trail across the Oklahoma Territory and into Kansas. At Abilene, the cattle were put on trains and carried to Chicago. In the next four years, more than one and a half million cattle were moved north over the Chisholm Trail to Kansas. Other trails were found as the railroad moved farther west. Trail drives usually began with the spring roundup. Cattlemen would send out cowboys to search the open grasslands for their animals. As the cattle were brought in, the young animals were branded, marked, to show who owned them. Then they were released with their mothers to spend another year in the open country. The other cattle were put together for the long drive to Kansas. Usually they were moved in groups of 2,500 to 5,000 animals. Twelve to twenty cowboys took them up the trail. The cowboys worked hard on a trail drive. They had to keep the herd together day and night and protect it from bad men and Indians. They had to keep the cattle from moving too fast or running away. If they moved too fast, they would lose weight and their owner would not get as much money for them. The cowboys would walk the cattle only 20 to 30 kilometers a day. The cattle could feed all night and part of the morning before starting each day. If the grass was good and the herd moved slowly, the cattle would get heavier and bring more money. In the early 1880s, the price of cattle rose to $50 each, and many cattlemen became rich. Business was so good that a $5,000 investment in the cattle industry could make $45,000 in four years. More and more people began raising cattle, and early cattlemen greatly increased the size of their herds. Within a few years, there was not enough grass for all the cattle, especially along the trails. There was so much meat that the price began to fall. There were two severe winters that killed hundreds of thousands of cattle. 
an extremely dry summer killed the grass, and thousands more died of hunger. The cattle industry itself almost died. Cattlemen also had problems with farmers and sheepmen. Farmers coming west would claim grassland used by the cattle growers. They would put up fences and plow up the land to plant crops. Other settlers brought huge herds of sheep to compete with cattle for the grass, and the sheep always won. Cattle would not eat grass where sheep had eaten. Violence broke out. Cattle growers fought the farmers and sheepmen for control of the land. The cattlemen finally had to settle land of their own, putting up fences and cutting the size of their herds. They no longer could let their cattle run free on public lands. By the late 1800s, the years of the cowboys were ending. But the story of the cowboy and his difficult life would not be forgotten. Even today, the cowboy lives in movies, on television, and in books. When one thinks of the Wild West of America, he does not think of the miners who opened the way to the West. Nor does he think of the men who struggled to build the first railroads across the wild land. And one does not think of the farmers who pushed slowly westward to fence, plow, and plant the land. The words Wild West bring to mind just one character, the cowboy. His difficult fight to protect his cattle on the long trail was an exciting story. It has been told by many writers. Perhaps the best known was a young Easterner, Owen Wister. He worked as a cattleman for several years, then wrote about the heroic life of the cowboy in a book called The Virginian. Another Easterner who came west to learn about the cowboy was the artist Frederick Remington. Remington was a cowboy for only two years, but he spent the rest of his life painting pictures of the West and writing about it. His exciting works made the West and the cowboy come to life for millions who never saw a real cowboy. The cowboy has also lived in music. He had his own kind of songs that told of his problems, his hopes, and his feelings. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 